so we've got a majority of the class here, and I've tied my shoes, so we can probably get started then. Let's see. Uh, also, we've got screen recording, screen recording turned on, and if you log into Blackboard, you should be able to see what's on my screen. If you can't, let me know because that's in, that's useful information for me. Uh, let's see what we got. Right. So today's topic will be Python. If you're an experienced programmer, you might be extremely bored by this class. I apologize in advance if that's the case. If you uh, are totally new to Python, you might also get lost. So there's like this fine, you know, there's a wide spectrum of people, and I'll only get to do one thing during class. So um, apologies in advance if this doesn't exactly hit you where you're at. Um, and if you're not being challenged or you're lost, then you should definitely talk to me because this format isn't great for doing one-on-one -on -one sort of remediation. So I can give you advanced challenges if that would be useful to you, or I can meet with you one-on-one -on -one to talk about how to get you up to speed most effectively. That's that's my goal, right? Like I want you to be productive and effective. That might take more than just the lecture interaction. All right, so we're gonna get started by talking with people. Right? This is like data science one-on-one is actually just 601 in this case, but the introductory data science class, we're gonna be talking to people. That's what data science is. So hopefully you submitted it in a, a homework that described an essay about the reading that you did. And I assigned this section of the class one reading assignment, and this section of the class a different reading assignment. So the magic sauce is we're gonna intermingle so that you can talk to someone who doesn't, who didn't read your article, and you'll describe to them what you learned. All right, guess what's gonna happen next? You have to find someone who read something that you didn't. Go. <laughs> I know it, it, it means you have to travel at least half a length of a classroom. <laughs> Finding anyone? All right, then that's you. Oh, wait. Yeah, 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 yeah. There we go. I'm <laughs> 
Back to our desk. All right, so that's going to be like a, a recurring theme of like doing some reading, talking about that reading with someone at the beginning of class, right? Or like talking about the homework that you did at the beginning of class with another student. That's that's a recurring theme. All right, so coming up, uh, the next week will be getting data and then data cleanup, and then the week after that, which I think is February twenty seventh, is we'll be doing some very short like lightning presentations on very simple problems. So I'll primarily be focused on data characterization. So I'll have more, like it's a little premature right now to, to like start you getting worried about that, because you're gonna have some homeworks. But the 27th will be a, a small presentation in class. So more details on that coming up. Uh, let's see. So we're gonna cover basically very, very superficial glance at Python and we'll do some exercises in class to sort of get you acclimated to the fact that it's a totally different way of thinking, a different way of writing, right? And and like telling your computer what to do that may be novel to you, and it takes a, a different mindset. So we're only going to be able to like talk about this for a few hours, right? But it takes literally years to become a uh, reasonably good programmer, right? And that's not to say if you've been programming for years you're good. It just takes a long time to become good. So. Um, the the hopefully this is a conversation that will make you more comfortable struggling to become a better programmer, right? Because like even no, no matter where you are at the spec in the spectrum of like programming skill, it's going to take you uh, effort to get to improve, and so that means you're going to have to work on that skill. You don't actually have to work at a skill; you can just sit there and not improve. Some people do that, right? That's a choice, and so. The investment in your improvement takes work. So this is like not going to get you there. It's going to make you more comfortable in doing that work. All right. Uh, let's see. So the very confusing thing that I'm going to inflict upon you in this class is we're not just teaching you Python. We're teaching you a whole bunch of things at the same time. Right? We're teaching you Python. Potentially, you're either using Docker. Or you're using Anaconda, you're using uh, Jupyter, right? And so there's all these things that we're talking about at the same time. So a little bit of emphasis in this lecture will be on like, what's one of these at a time so that we can like mash them together to get even more productivity. But um, it's going to be confusing because like you'll say like, is this a feature of Jupyter or a feature of Python, right? And is this uh, a Python specific thing or is it Anaconda? And so like because you haven't had exposure to all of these tools. That that simultaneous learning causes confusion. So I apologize for that. That's just like a fact of life in this class. My motivation for using Docker again, even though not all of you are running that, and that's cool. If you're not running it, you're probably running Anaconda. So that's totally acceptable. Docker is something that you'll probably encounter when you go off into the, the real work environment as a data scientist. Uh, there's a good reason for that, but 
Uh, I'll, I'll probably not talk too much about that specifically in this class, uh, this lecture. Yeah, so like I said, I'm not teaching you all of Python. You have two and a half hours with me tonight um, and more class, more classes ahead. But I'll start assuming that we've talked about things once and therefore you know them, which is a totally invalid assumption, right? <laughs> if you've ever learned a language and you talk, like we did one example, so I assume you know it. Like that's, that's what I'll do, but it's sort of a jerk move, right? All right, so luckily I'm not the only person that you can draw on for learning the skill set. So as I pointed out before, I've got lots of hyperlinks here, and uh, there's you know free online courses. There's tons of textbooks, both hard copy at the library or free PDFs online, and you can always email me. Right? That's that's like. My go-to is like if you're really lost and you don't even know where to start, you ask me a question. And the, the last comment down here is like a reminder on imposter syndrome. Who here has heard of or is familiar with imposter syndrome? One. All right. So I'm gonna take some time to talk about that. So this is the idea: as a data scientist, right, you're gonna be given some some role that typically has some responsibility and authority, and people will look to you as an expert. And it's gonna be confusing because they're gonna think that you're an expert programmer that you're a computer scientist, that you're a mathematician, that you know statistics very deeply, right? <laughs> Those are probably false assumptions. Right? But people are gonna have these expectations about you, about skills and background and training, like, oh, you've been to UMBC and you have a master's in data science, you must be the man, right, or the woman, like, that's cool. It's probably not the case, and so you're gonna have this, this, this cognitive dissonance between what you know that you know and what they think you know. And if that's a significant gap, Right, that can cause some stress. So has anyone here experienced that type of stress of like people thinking you know something because you're supposedly educated versus like <laughs> what you know you actually know, which is me. I get a survey on that. Is that okay. So you've experienced what I would call imposter syndrome. People have expectations about you, but you may not be living up to or you have the background and experience to support that. So if you feel alone in that, that's very common. Feeling isolated and sort of like scared, that's totally common. And so it's given a name, imposter syndrome, so that you can say, oh yeah, I'm feeling that thing that has a label, like, which feels better than like not knowing, like, oh, I didn't know that I knew that. All right, so imposter syndrome, I'd suggest reading on that. It's super common in data science because there are so many unreasonable expectations about your expertise, right? If someone thinks you're a mathematician and you're trained as a mathematician, there's less of a gap. Right? But for someone to think you're a programmer and a mathematician and whatever domain expert like they think you are, right, that's unreasonable. And so you will encounter this, and that's something that you'll have to sort of psychologically adjust to. So someone having like quick off the bat like coping mechanisms they've arrived at. Honesty, absolutely. This, this is being very upfront. Like yes, I have. A degree, a master's degree in, in data science, you know, from UMBC, and I don't know what it is you're talking about, right? <laughs> that can be very like it deflates your reputation in some sense, right? And so there's some some harm in that to your reputation. But the other alternative is they expect that you know something, and then you you know fail because you actually don't. That's probably worse. So I'll advocate honesty as a great coping mechanism. <laughs> All right, so. Questions on that? Because th th again, this is more emotional processing, not the hard data science stuff. All right. <laughs> I'll, I'll be using this exact same link when we talk about math. I'm also not a mathematician. All right. <laughs> so the, the first part that we'll get started with is sort of this confusion of data science in software. So. I'm not expecting that you've heard of all of these different um, software applications, but I am strongly confident that someone here has heard of or used at least you know a couple of these, and it's it's going to be a difference, right? So I was just talking to Jack. Jack has over 20 years of SaaS experience, right? That like blows me out of the water because like I'm not a SaaS expert, right? Um, who here has used? I mean, I'm not a MATLAB background. Okay, we've got one MATLAB person. Yeah, um, Java. There's gotta be some Java programs, right? Yeah, components, right? And so, so this problem is like, 
in data science, any one of these languages might be applicable to the problem that you're working. And you may have a background in that, and like people are like impressed. Oh, you know, it's like MATLAB or Excel. Like, like that's cool, right? The problem is like you can't become an expert in every one of these languages, right? And this this is not comprehensive, right? This is just like the things that came to my mind as soon as this problem arose of like, oh, these are all the things. So, like, like that's a lot to learn, and it's unreasonable to learn all of them. So then I have to make a choice. Well, which one of these am I going to learn? Because I or at least become an expert in. So. That's like the the first problem, and so I'm I'm claiming that there's some, can be some some consequences, right? Like someone walks up to you and they're like, "Oh, you don't know Excel?" Like, "Well, I know Excel, but uh, do you know MATLAB?" And then it's like this like fear-based sort of like, "Oh, you know, am I better than that?" Right? So that can be a, a thing that you should sort of recognize, and it's worth it, worse than just sort of like not knowing something. It actually causes problems, and the problems are. When someone knows, you know, MapReduce, and another person knows TensorFlow, they're going to have a really hard time talking about the same problem. Right? Hopefully, they recognize they're working on the same problem. But coming from different languages, they have different mindsets about how they solve problems, about what the assumptions and expectations are. And, and so, <laughs> and typically, the re one reason why there are so many different software programs is because they're trying to solve sort of different um, problems. And so. Maybe one is for like really big problems and one is for like smaller problems, but is really fast, right? And and so like they're working in different trade spaces about what they're trying to solve. And and this can you know we have collaboration. So that's that's a, a a thing to think about. When you're interacting with another data scientist, one of the first conversations is, Oh, are you Python or R or you know MATLAB or like, you know, <laughs> what tribe are you in? <laughs> Which if you're not in the same tribe, you're less likely to work together, which is a little, a little scary. All right. So I'm going to make your life easy, right? I'm going to say Python. That's it. Like, <laughs> I've simplified all that complexity down to one language. So I've removed all of your choices, and we're working with Python 3, with, which is like a, a, a slight modification of older Python 2. But Python is like super old, and Python 3 is 10 years old, right? Like, so it's pretty stable. It's been around for a while. You should like have a you know some exposure to it in this class, and so this this should make your life easy, right? I lied. Sorry. <laughs> but the problem in Python is there are so many libraries and modules to learn to increase your productivity, right? Like you can write everything from scratch in Python. That that's not cool, right? That'd be very painful, and so you really do want to leverage these. Um, sets of software that other people have provided for you. And typically, these, these try and solve a very narrow problem in Python. And so one of your tricks as a data scientist will be to know what are all the different modules that could potentially apply to my problem, and then how do I stitch those together into an effective way of solving my, my specific problem? So if you haven't grappled with sort of like the library problem, like start thinking about that. Because like, it means you have to have an inventory of packages or at least be able to search through them for a functionality. You're not even sure that it exists in a library, right? And like, <laughs> this is a problem. So um, there's not a trivial solution that I can just tell you of like, this is the recipe for finding the library. And nope, you just have to have some working memory of all of them, or at least a good significant portion. If, if you're an advanced programmer, challenge for you like right now, go off and tell me how many um, modules are available in Python. Like, I actually. Have some idea of what the number is, so, um, <laughs> but it's a huge number, and so, so, the problem that we're talking about with multiple different languages, it we down selected the Python, but we still have that same problem of like we still have a bunch of libraries to learn. So, all right, and by the way, I will not be using all of these in this class. So we'll focus probably on a pandas as the primary, and like a couple other ones, maybe like a total of ten to fifteen. So that'll be our, our working set, but uh, there's a lot that we won't cover. Uh, questions on that before we move on? So I started using some words that are specific to Python, and that is going to probably cause some confusion if you don't already know these words. So I'm going to provide a little snippet of sort of like what I mean by them. So you can refer back to this after the slides are available on Blackboard. But uh, it's just the concept that we have 
things that we write. We typically refer to those as scripts. And then we have sort of packages or modules or libraries, like all of these things. Um, I'll probably use those words interchangeably sometimes, but it's a way of having source code that does a thing that you can reference in your script. Mm, yeah. Uh, as I mentioned, there are things that manage these libraries. The one that I would refer you to is Anaconda. I don't actually use it myself, so it's sort of hypocrisy, but <laughs> I'm planning to use a tool that I don't use. So I use a different package manager called PIP um, for probably historical reasons. And so uh, it's just a way of not having to manage everything manually yourself. And a package manager makes your life easier. It doesn't solve the discoverability problem. You still have to figure out which libraries you want, so you can tell Anaconda which one it's going to solve. But it solves some of the problem of figuring out how to get that on your computer and making it available in your environment. So that's the role of a package manager. All right. All right. So why am I harping on this? Right. Earlier I said you could just write all the functionality that you need in your program yourself. Right, wouldn't that be easier? Then you wouldn't have to memorize all these crazy libraries. Right? But the, the problem is you'll probably not implement, it, implement that same functionality as effectively, and you'll have to maintain all that code yourself. Right? And so the real trick here is to leverage other people's work. That's, that's really what I'm advocating for. Figuring out that, that trade-off of like, how do I know which libraries to use and how much time to invest in searching for those libraries versus writing my own code? Again, there's not like a well-defined formula. So there may be some package that does 70% of the functionality you want, but maybe the actual time it takes to write that code is only 10 minutes. So maybe it's just like easier to write it myself, right? So <laughs> this is a problem uh, a friend of mine ran into is that they were writing an algorithm, um, and it took them 10 lines to implement, and to reference it in a library, yeah, you could have done that, but you just write it yourself. So there's a trade-off there. I'll typically advocate not doing things yourself if possible. Because I'm lazy, right? This is a, a tenant of being a data scientist. You should be as lazy as possible. Can anyone explain like why you'd want to do that? Why, why is laziness a virtue? <laughs> yeah, that's a consequence. Efficiency. Efficiency. What is what is it? Efficiency with respect to what? Um, you don't have to write twelve lines. Which saves you time, right? And fewer bugs, right? So there, that's not to say libraries are not bug-free, right? Libraries contain bugs, but they're not your bugs, right? And there's a community of people usually supporting a library, hopefully. Uh, and so, like having many people look at code reduces the number of bugs on it, right? Versus your code you've written, lots of people are not reviewing that, just you. And so uh, it reduces the number of bugs and Saves you time. So those are good things, in my opinion. The other thing that is cool in Python is all these libraries, well, almost all of them, are open source. And so if you are really confused about like how do I write good code, well, you can just look at these like professionally done libraries, right, and and see how they're implemented. John, I was also going to comment. GitHub is your friend. Yes, there's lots of packages on GitHub. And they'll like I've actually emailed someone who like wrote a library. <laughs> right, the people who write these libraries are actual humans, right? <laughs> That's cool, and you get to talk to them. Like, like on Stack Overflow, often library authors. So, like, if there's a if there if there's a small library that few people are using, often the library maintainer is the person answering the question on Stack Overflow, right? which is a very cool sort of personalization, right? Like, you can't get much better than that. Like, <laughs> you can fly over your house or something, but I don't know. Stack Overflow is good enough for me. <laughs> All right, time to use Python. Woo. All right, so as I mentioned, there's different ways that you can use Python. Um, the three that are in my repertoire are using an interactive command line prompt, and I'll show you that. And then there's a second method, which is writing a text file with, which ends in .py. That's usually referred to as a script. And the script can be interpreted by the the, in the command prompt, or you can just double click on it sometimes in, in Windows or Linux. And so, like, 
there's different ways of uh, launching that, but the scripts are basically a set of commands that you would normally type into the REPL. So there's there's sort of an interchangeability there. The last method, which is what we'll primarily be focused on in this class, is using Jupyter. And so Jupyter is this web interface, which is handy because it combines the ability to document your things, run, write and run your code, and produce visualizations. And so all the things that you need to do in one place. And that's handy because when you do your assignment, you just send me the Jupyter Notebook in Blackboard. Like, there's one thing that goes over. So compare that with the, the confusion of like writing a script and sending me a text file and all the images, right? Like, that'd just be a pain in the neck for me and you. So having all of your stuff in one place makes it more readable, both for the producer, yourself, and the consumer, me. Right, I think, yeah. So the REPL is just some jargony term. Basically, it says like you put something in, and then it's interpreted, and then you you get it, the results back, and then it just starts over again. All right. So I'm going to show you the Python interpreter. Maybe. I'm going to have to make this really big. I don't even know if I have Python. It's true. I'm going to close these tabs so they're not relevant and open up a console. All right, so this is a terminal. Hope that shows up. In my notebook environment. And so let's see. So this is like a, a normal uh, Linux man prompt shell. So if you're in Windows, your, your command prompt is sort of the equivalent to this, although it functions slightly differently. And I can type in Python. And I'll get to the prompt change, right? So I previously had like this crazy name here, and a dollar sign, and that was the Linux command prompt. And then I typed in Python, and I got back into the Python prompt. So it's sort of similar, and that's waiting for you to put in the command. That's why it's command prompt. Right? But the Python interpreter is in order with these little three here waiting for your prompt. So. Again, this is very, very basic, and I'm starting here so that we can later claim that I showed you this. All right, so this is the simplest thing I can do. put in a number, nothing happens, it just comes back up. No magic. And then I can do something that isn't too complicated, right? I'll add two numbers. So again, nothing crazy. So far, so good. Now we can do something that's sort of like, huh, that's interesting. I wonder what, what else we can do. So I'm going to store uh, the numbers 4 plus 3 into a variable. Right. x now has the value of 7. Shocking. Hopefully, that shouldn't be. All right. So now I'm going to type uh, a string. This is where maybe we're deviating back from the we're deviating from like the calculator mode into something a little bit different. So I can have these things called strings, which are collections of characters that are wrapped in single quotes, double quotes. I mean, I can store those to variables. Right? So I say x equals hello. Oops. Add an extra space there. So now if I say, what is the value of x? It's a string. So I just overwrote the value of 7. All right. Nobody's confused yet, right? Everybody's happy? Because we're going to get confused at some point and lose like half the class. So I'm trying to figure out when exactly that transition occurs. I'm going to keep asking these questions. All right. So now we're going to go on and we're going to do something crazy, right? So we've got a list of things. Specifically, I've got uh, some numbers and I've got some some strings. Oh, eight. All right. So this list is is somewhat easy to understand. It's got two types of data in it, though, right? And so that's 
maybe that's surprising to you. Hopefully that's that's pretty straightforward to understand though. It's got two things. All right, so next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna access the element at the zeroth location. So this is your first sort of like introduction to computers. Some languages start their counting at zero, Python being one of them. So in this case, we have one, two, three, four, five elements. What's the zeroth element? Three, perfect. Because we're counting from, it's the zeroth element, the first element, right, and so forth. So that's cool, so we can access that. And we have these, now this is where the memorization comes in. So my list. So, so a couple of things that you're gonna have to start memorizing, just I'm gonna apologize, like that's computers. So you're gonna have to memorize the fact that my list, when I um, fed it this set of values, I had to use these square brackets. And if you haven't seen those on your keyboard, look for them, they're there. This square bracket denotes that the contents are going to be a list, and that list is going to be produced from word in a variable. So for consistency's sake, luckily, when I ask what is the zeroth element, I'm using those same square brackets. But um, So there's going to be a little confusion, because now I go off and I use this command len at length, right? This is shortened version of the normal English you use, and now I'm using these parentheses. So when to use which, right? <laughs> In some sense, it's just sort of a memorization game. There, there's there's underlying reasons why you use one versus the other, right? Like length is a function that's looking for a variable to be passed into it, and so therefore you use parentheses. So functions typically are using parentheses. Lists are using square brackets. It's just a choice, right? Like that was the choice when they designed the language, and so that's the choice you'll have to memorize when you use the language. All right, as we counted before, it's from the counting 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, but there are five elements in it. All right. So, I, again, who is, no one's lost here, right? right? Like, very straightforward. All right. So now we're going to do my list uh, 12. All right. What's going to happen? Someone raise their hand? Uh, yeah. Dan. Hmm? Go ahead. All right. Yes, there's going to be some error because what you're looking for is the 12th element in a five element list. It doesn't exist. So Python's like, I don't know what you're asking for. Right? And so this is now going to be the fun part is that you're writing your long program with hundreds of lines of code. Like I joke, like by the end of the semester, you'll be doing that and you'll be like, ah, of course. Right? And so, but the problem is you're going to be doing some assumptions in that code. And your assumptions will often be wrong, in which case your program will crash with some like crazy thing like this, and you're just like, I don't know what's going on, right? <laughs> and, and so the very frustrating part of programming is memorizing all this arcane stuff, and then you type it in because you know what you want it to do, and then it doesn't work, and you're just like, oh my god, right? And so there's this disconnect between what you think the program should do and what the computer is very keeping track of very, very precisely. And so when you ask for things that aren't going to work, Python's going to give you back an error, and uh, That'll be for you to debug and figure out why that is. It typically won't have a great explanation of like your assumption that there was a 12 element list and in fact there's only five, that's not gonna be printed out. And it's just gonna say like, I don't know what you're doing. And that's the best it can do. All right, so <laughs> now I'm gonna, <laughs> I, I hope this confuses some people because it probably confused me when I was learning, so. All right, three and five and nine. All right. I'm going to do something wild and crazy. I'm going to store a list, the zero element of my list. All right. So, so now we're going to take some, some time to figure out, okay, the length of that list is five. <laughs> oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. All right. I just put in three elements, but I put them into the zeroth element of that original list. So let's take a look at my list. A list and a list. Woo. All right. Now we're we get, now we're getting into power, right? So the uh, zero element is a three element list, right? And so this is like now your brain starting like churn. If like if you haven't programmed before, like this is where we start getting a little a little crazy. All right, we'll switch back and see how I'm doing, whether I'm on track or not. Yeah. So that's that's what I was looking for. So we've got everything there. So that was sort of like. Uh, a relatively straightforward, I think, experts in, yeah. All right. 
So questions on this, right? Wild and crazy stuff, but hopefully we haven't lost our one yet. We're good. All right. So next idea that I wanted to share with you is dictionaries. So, all right. So I'm going to say, uh, so if you recall from last class, we had key value pairs. And basically, a list of those is a dictionary. Right? All right. So my dic is four and three. All right. So what I just put in was a single key and value pair of it colon. Right. And you'll notice now I've got a third sort of style thing going on. Right. I've got these curly breaks. That denotes a dictionary. All right, so the fun thing now, I'm going to just, let's see what my dict returns. So if you have like a question of like, what does this command do? Like just shout it out and I'll type it in and we'll see what it does, right? So it's freestyling. Okay, all right, so otherwise I'm just going to go on my little script here. So my dict, I'm going to, I'm going to access the key of four, right? And this should return the value. So. I can access the elements of that dictionary by the key. Everybody's cool. All right. So I can let's make another one. My So now if I go off and I rerun that same old command, so I just put in a new dictionary in that same variable, and now that no longer works, right? Okay, so no big surprise there. If we look at my dict, that key and value. And so like a, a sort of natural uh, question that I think you'd have, like I can get back the, the value for a given key. It's not quite as simple going the other way, so I can't, I can't say like, what is the key associated with the value? It's not bidirectional. And so you're typically accessing elements of a dictionary by the key, um, but it's, it's not intended to be used to look up values with what is the key. Does that make sense? Question, Travis. You always have to have the quotes. No, so let's, let's make a, let's see. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna do some, some crazy stuff here. So we're gonna say five. Six. All right. So now my dict contains two keys, a as a string, and five as a as a as a key. And so I can have uh, strings be the keys or the variables, right? I can have lists even. So I can say my dict of uh, six. Like anything, so the constraint here on what is allowed to be a key, it has to be a hashable value. So it has to be a unique entry. So like a list for various, a list is not hashable. So there's not a unique representation of a list. And so a list can't be a key. Uh, so all the keys have to be unique. So I cannot have two keys of the same value. So those are like two tips hidden in the response there. So, yeah, so I think I covered most of that. And then, like, this, yeah, yeah. Does it have to be consistency between the key and the value in terms of the string? No. So, here, here we have a key being uh, a number, right, and the value of the list. But to answer your question more specifically, let's, let's make a predict of uh, then and yeah. Right. So you can mix types. Okay. And then, like obviously, if I look for things that aren't there in the list of keys, so I'll say like you know, 75. I'm gonna get back a key error. So basically, if, if you read this message, it basically says I can't find the key of uh, 75 in that dictionary. Right. And then they also uh, another little sort of like what are the keys? Right, that's like another command. And so 
there are ways of sort of uh, asking the dictionary what does it contain, and that's that'll be very useful for you typically. Oh yeah, I'm just gonna show one more. So my All right, so let's close that up. Oops, what did I miss? Oh, wrong one. Yeah. All right, so now I just created a relatively complicated idea, right? So I have my dictionary, and then it has a key of the string AF, and we're setting the value of that key to be equal to this thing, which happens to be itself a dictionary. Where the dictionary contains two keys, four, and this string, with the, the values of a string and a list. Right? So you can, so this is where your nightmares begin because you can construct arbitrarily complicated data structures by like nesting things. And so, uh, let's look at my dict. So this dictionary is complicated, and so. And maybe one of the takeaway messages, try to avoid uh, creating these arbitrarily complicated data structures, even though they're sort of, they can be convenient while you're making them. The hard part comes in using them appropriately next time you want to reference the values in that dictionary. So you can have like, you know, 10 nested dictionaries, but accessing that 10th sort of nested dictionary can be kind of a nightmare to re-navigate your way down to that level. John. Um, so some some libraries come pre-installed with Anaconda, and then the list of libraries pre-installed with a Docker image that I create are separate. So like it varies. Is the answer. And so you may. What was that? What was that? No. Yeah, so, so knowing, <laughs> you'll have to know like both which libraries you need and then like whether to install them. So you'll go to use them and then they just don't work and then you'll say, oh, I have to install that one. So the turnaround on that's pretty short. Okay, so I'm gonna leave dictionaries for a moment. Questions on that? All right, we're happy. All right, so that's what I just showed you. Uh, it's time for a break. Mm, yeah, I think. All right, so we're going to take a break, and we'll come back at 8 p.m., seven minutes. <laughs>
All right, so we're we're gonna need paper. Do people need paper like to write things? Do you have paper? So I'm gonna assume people have paper and just leave them up here. To, uh, to submit something to you, professor, or just to have to write down? Uh, that's a good question. It's gonna be for you to retain. So uh, the paper will be in your possession, and not back to me. So we're waiting on two people uh, just while we're waiting for them. The next exercise we're going to do requires you having some paper to write things on. So if you don't have paper or a pencil, I have both up here. <laughs> And you're going to be keeping these. Well, keeping the paper, I can send them. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
One more. Right. Well, <laughs> sorry. You certainly could list every single key, right? Mm -hmm. And then for one of the keys that you care about, list all the sorry, list all the values, and then find one of the values you care about, and then for that value, loop through all of the keys and figure out which key has that value, and then you know that that key is through that value, right? So like. You could do some gymnastics to figure out what the key is from the value. I'm not saying you can't do that. I'm just saying it's typically not done. Correct. You may have yeah five of the value and a bunch of keys. So we must. All right. We will resume without Zach currently. So the thing that I'm going to have you work on on paper is to write down your meals for today. Hopefully you all ate food today. Yes. All right, so let's say you had breakfast and you had cereal and you had toast and you had orange juice. All right. So the challenge for you is uh, for that meal, you should have like a, you know, some things associated with a meal. And you have uh, another meal, let's say I had lunch, I had soup, and I had crackers, and then for dinner, before coming to this class, I had a grilled cheese sandwich and a milkshake. Okay. I just gave you a bunch of data. Like, you should have your own data, right? This is you creating the data that you have. And on paper, write down that dictionary. Right? So write that down. We'll talk a little bit about like how we did that, and then we'll implement it on a computer. <laughs> Again, this will be a recurring theme of Design, then implement. If you go straight to implement, it won't be as good. I'm just speaking from experience. So on paper, design that dictionary, right? For the meals that you ate today and all the things you ate. And maybe you had like, you know, a mid-morning snack, right? You want to include that. Or at a, uh, it's called a latte at a the Starbucks on campus here. So there's some snacks. What does that dictionary look like? Look at that. Timing. <laughs> they got food, obviously. <laughs> We're doing an, uh, an exercise that includes exactly the thing you did, which is eating food. So we're starting out on paper and pen. Before moving to the computer, you need paper or pen? Have both. So once you've had a chance to think about that and start writing things down, um, I'll ask for some hands to describe their dictionary to the class. So this is like a volunteering, and I'll probably select someone who has not gone before. So if you've already participated, I probably won't call them. So this isn't meant intentionally as a memory exercise. Like if you forgot something, don't feel bad. That's not the goal. Okay, so someone who has not previously participated in class so far, like one-on-one, -on -one, what, what's something that you came up with in your dictionary? Like, what's your design of your data? Yeah. Um, so I had my dates, um, then I had strings, so the keys, breakfast, and then got into the Okay. Then I had comma, lunch, okay. um, breakfast, and then dinner. Each of your meals? And you were constituted of one thing? Oh, well, I kept a couple of things. Yeah, so this is like my meal. So I had a breakfast and I had a lunch. And I had a pizza and a meal. And I had a salad. And I had a meal. So you had two keys with the same yeah. drink? Uh, I had one key with two keys. Okay. 
So what was all of the keys in your different stuff, right? All right, so those are sort of like where I was aiming. So I have like some unique strings, right, as the keys, and then either a string or a list of strings as the values for each of those keys. That's that's the, that was that was the design intent from my perspective. So the next phase of this is to go to your computer, open up Jupyter or your terminal if you have that in Jupyter. Um, and enter the thing that you have on your paper. Right? So now we're going to test how good was your understanding of the dictionary syntax. So if you type in what you had on your paper and it turns out to not work, that's an indicator that you have a little bit more memorization to work on for dictionaries. So I will be walking around. If you have questions, snag me.
So, uh, uh, barring any other raised hands, I will move on. So I'm gonna uh, let's see. So I'm gonna come back to my Python terminal. So again, I'm running in Jupyter. I opened up a terminal. That's how I got into here, and I typed Python. So that's that's the environment that I'm using. Let's see my meals. So my meals is a dictionary. And I'm gonna set that equal to curly bracket. So here's a little trick for you, by the way, a little programming trick. So when I create a new dictionary, I'm just going to start by typing the open and close curly brackets. That's a reminder to myself right, that eventually I'm going to have to come back and close it. So now when I start typing, I'm already in a dictionary. So this sort of an automatic pairing of, of like parentheses or curly brackets or square brackets is a useful trick if that doesn't happen automatically in, your, in the tool you're using. Breakfast was an apple. I'm going to separate the key and value by a comma, right? And then I have lunch. And I had uh, you know, beans and you know, salmon. All right. So, so that's like a, a potentially reasonable thing. I'll look at my meals. And and the problem that you could potentially run into is if you say like my meals dinner calls this equals and so now now it's now it's now I've confused it, but it hasn't given me an error. Right? Everybody wanna tell me what happened? Right. Right. So Python is looking for that other pair, right? The trick that I just told you about, like having the pair bracket. And so what it assumes is, oh, you must be wanting to try to add more content. And so it's putting these triple dots here. And so if you're in this case, all I need to do is close out those those bracket, and it'll be fine, right? So now I can say my meals, and I, I see that it has breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and a string. And so that was the goal. So anybody have questions on that? That that's your introduction to dictionaries. You're now you now know how to write a dictionary. That's that's a powerful skill set because we're gonna be building on that throughout the rest of this class, primarily in pandas. Um, but it's it's like a thing that's very flexible and useful. Yeah. Ah, so let's see. It's a reasonable question. Let's see if I so I I'm gonna experiment live here and I don't know the answer to this one, but I'm gonna say like let's say x equals All right, so I've got some string and that one it doesn't work for the line continuation. Um so I, I couldn't sort of close that off. I think so for lists, I'm trying to think of what other data structures that would happen for. I think probably also for a dictionary, so like if it's create a so let's, let's say I've got this dictionary where I've put in the key and value and a comma. Right, that's probably going to give me an ellipsis, yeah. So, so data structures, yes. Other data structures, no. Sort of like where the breakpoints are in the interpretation of the command. Yeah. Well, so the ellipsis isn't a warning. It's a line continuation. Yeah. So there I just close it off. And then when I look at my meals, breakfast will be fine. Or my meals is now just a key and value pair. The reason that's so the reason why do we have line continuation? That's because like sometimes we have these really long lots of data, and it's easier for a human to interpret that as a set of lines rather than just one really long line. So that's where line continuation come in. Brad. Uh 
let's see, like, I think drop, you know, or like delete. I think, I don't, I don't have the exact command to memorize, but yes, you can drop a key value code. All right. All right, yep. So, so now we can access things and like, <laughs> this alone is not that useful, but the concept you're learning up there. My screen is being put again. Okay, I'm not sure why it's broken off. Mm. Yeah, all right. So there, there's a whole large number of things that we haven't explored yet, but I consider them sufficiently intuitive that I'm not going to spend a ton of time covering them as in depth as I just did. And so we did explore variable assignment. We're reversing like x equals four plus three, right? And that's actually x equals seven. So we did a little bit of that. Um, we can do the same thing with strings. I can assign uh, a variable and a value. And that's cool stuff, but pretty straightforward. Control statements where you have like an if, else. Again, those are very common. You'll see those in just about every single language, right? And so these are very common concepts um, that I think are relatively straightforward. Loops, again, every language implements loops differently. So like, like I want to do something 10 times. Well, the way in which you do that in a specific language will be different, but the concept is typically there. And then sets and tuples, I'm not going to spend too much time worrying about that, but we won't touch on that too strong in this class, and then functions uh, we'll use a ton. And so functions I'm going to spend a little bit of time on, but these show up, these, these same core concepts show up in just about every language. So if you've been exposed to any language, you're probably somewhat familiar with them. And I think they're relatively straightforward to learn. So functions I will spend a little bit of time on. All right. So in Python, the way to represent, then, okay, so the, the way that we represent a set of code in a thing that we can call again is a function. That's, that's like Ben Devin, right? So every single line is being executed, but then when you get to a function, it's like this bundle of code that you can reuse elsewhere. That's why it's useful. The, the, the main core concepts in Python to, to keep track of for functions is keyword depth. It identifies that we are starting a set of code that identifies a function. It's like the purpose of that keyword. It means you can't use that keyword elsewhere. Then we're going to have the name of the function, which I have very you know, brilliantly named my func. So that's the name of the thing. That's sort of the, the way that we access that function later is by using that same label. And then the arguments to the function, in this case, a variable called input. Like I can have as many input variables that I want my function. They'll just be separated by a list. But it's basically all the things that we're passing into this block of code. And then typically, your function does something. Here, I've put in a comment. So the comment line starts with a pound or hash symbol. And so this function, it turns out, doesn't actually do anything other than return a thing that I haven't defined. And so like, the return statement is another keyword. And it's returning whatever I want. In this case, the variable value. But I haven't assigned it anything, so that function actually would work. All right. If that didn't confuse you, uh, <laughs> congratulations. All right. So the the way that we're gonna exercise this, let's let's go off and I think uh, yeah. So I'm gonna escape out of this. Come over to here. All right. So F A. So I'm, I'm going to make a function that takes no inputs and then returns the string hello. So pretty straightforward. Uh, the, the trick that I haven't explained to you yet is indentation. So in Python, the convention is to indent your things that are within a function by four spaces. And the same convention applies to loops and anything else where you have an indentation, it's four spaces. So that's a, a strong warning not to use tabs. I'm going to have a, a, a reason why you wouldn't use tabs to indent the text. Okay. 
So the reason is, so tabs are bad, and the reason tabs are bad is because some computers assume that a tab is two spaces, some computers assume that a tab is four spaces, and some computers assume whatever else, right? And so tabs can be redefined in terms of spaces, but that can get confusing because when you have code that has a mixture of tabs and spaces, and then you bring it over to some other computer that doesn't interpret tabs the same way, like, you know, that's not forced to be the same, uh, it can break your code. So that's a Python specific problem, but it's the reason we don't use tabs, and we stay to the convention of using four spaces. All right, so I'm gonna, so back to that line continuation, like it knew that I needed to put more things in here, so it brought me in analysis, so that's cool. So I've just defined a function, let's use it. Awesome, right? We called this function and it put us a string. Nobody should be scared yet, right? Uh, and this one will do some math. So we're going to say e equals five, and we'll re return a plus two. All right. So I've got a function. I'm going to call it. Let's just check. Let's just see if a is defined yet, right? So a, even though I've set that value within the function. The scope of that variable is constrained to be local to that set of code. So that can trip you up and probably will. Uh, but the value of A isn't defined yet because it's only defined locally within that function. So now let's call another. All right, so we returned the value of A equals five and added two in the return. All right, so now let's check if A is defined. Still not defined. So that value of A is never visible to us running in the main program. So this local variable scope can be confusing because some variables are global. They can be accessed outside of the function and others are local. But by the default, that variable is only present within the function. Questions on scope? OK. So now let's do. Uh, let's see. Mm -hmm. So if I type B, what am I going to get back? Five. All right, we're all in consensus. That's good. Cool. Uh, like this. So it's going to. So I'm going to break this function to start. So I'm going to pass it nothing. Right, and it's like I don't know what to do because when you define that function, you said that you're going to give me a variable, uh, a variable called val, and I called the function without passing anything. So it, even though this function never actually used the variable val, the function complained about, hey, you didn't match the number of input arguments I expected. So, all right. So we used the value that was defined within the function without redefining it, because if I type d here, I still get five back. Sounds good. So basically, that's what we're calling. <coughs> All right. So some of you, um, I think, already know this. But for those of you who don't, the way that you edit Python scripts um, is a little bit different than what we've been doing. What we've been doing so far, if you remember, let's pull this out. We've been operating so far in the terminal. And so this is an environment that hopefully you become comfortable with in the long term, but I don't expect that in this class because we'll mostly be using Jupyter. The other thing that we won't be hitting on too hard is uh, Python scripts. So in Windows, you can use Notepad 
uh, to compose a plain text file that ends in the .py, and then run that um, in your in your command prompt, and then you have text edit and map. All right. So confusingly, in Windows, they hide the file extension. So you're editing a plain text file in Notepad, and you don't know what the extension is. There's going to be some settings to change. All right. So with that as the lead-in, find a partner who we haven't you haven't talked with at the beginning class, or I haven't met up with yet. So find someone new. Okay, so now that you've met your partner, we're going to do an exercise. And the exercise hopefully is useful to at least one of you. So, out of the two of you, one of you has less experience. That's a good thing. So what we're going to be doing uh, with this exercise is printing. Uh, is it the same? Yeah. So we're going to create a .py file that, when executed, prints the string "hello" to the screen. So if you're experienced, that's super boring, right? But for those of you who are new, this will be a challenge. And so hopefully you randomly paired up in the set that uh, someone will value in this. Yeah. All right. And if both of you are highly experienced, then I have a challenge for you. I want you to solve this problem. Uh, but if you're having trouble with the hello world, don't worry about the challenge over All right. Go. I'll be walking around and talking to people. So first solve the hello printing world problem before moving on. Like solve that problem first, right? I don't want people working on palindromes if you don't know how to solve hello world. Yeah. 
Alright, so for those of you using Mac, I apologize. I didn't really expect that it was that bad. That's not what you expect. Okay. 
questions? So most of the people have gotten through the exercise. I'm going to, I think, move on. Yeah. So I'm going to move on. You can move back to your desk. All right. Uh, so on those exercises, a few people had some issues that I'm going to reconvene after class with them. But for the most part, the assumption at this point is that you were making it through that exercise. I mean, so what was the point of that? The point of that exercise was that 
we initially were using the terminal, or I was demonstrating the use of the terminal, right? That's those like three angle brackets to, to type, type in raw commands. What you just did was you used a, uh, the Python interpreter to run a script. So that was good. Good job. We're going to do a, the next thing, like we're moving on to later, the actual use of a Jupyter notebook. So we haven't quite gotten there yet, but we're sort of flushing out these different ways of doing uh, programming. So in most of the class, we'll be focused on Jupyter, but the, all of this pain that you were experiencing during this lecture was the exposure that Jupyter isn't the only way. Right? And so sometimes, if you go to some other place and they're like, Jupyter, we don't have that, right? that shouldn't stop you. Right? You should be able to operate as a programmer in environments with different capabilities. So if you only have access to uh, a text editor and the Python like uh, interpreter, like that shouldn't prevent you from being successful. So we're going to assume for the rest of this class that you have Jupyter. But what you just demonstrated to yourself, hopefully, is that you can use the Python interpreter. So that was the point of all that work. All right. So some idiosyncrasies that uh, we've gone over, just to recap uh, the spaces. So if you've typed in like functions and definitions with the keyword there, you have to indent four spaces. That's like a, a recurring theme in your life for the rest of the semester. Uh, and then uh, another thing that we touched on was indexing from zero. So the list length and uh, the way in which you access that list is uh, different in Python. And that's not consistent. Like different languages make different assumptions. And so it's either like starting from one or starting from zero, depending on what language you're in. Yeah, I don't think I'm going to worry about types at this point. And then, so not right now, and probably not in this class, but in the future, when you're writing lots and lots of Python, the problem you'll encounter is that other people have to read your code, right? And it works the other way around. Other people will write code that you have to read. Like, that's going to be very difficult. And one thing that people have developed over time to deal with that issue, because different people write code in different ways, is they come up with conventions of what the right thing to do is. Sounds good, right? Makes your job easier. There's less transition between like the way that you think and the way someone else is think. By you both using the same convention. And then they went another step further, and they wrote some tools that check your code, to whether it meets the, uh, the convention about how code should be written. Like, that's cool, right? Like, we write tools to check the code that we write. That's, that's a cool thing, right? So these are called linters, and the linter checks your code for lint, right? Like, that's the idea. And so, like, looking for things that, like, aren't breaking the functionality, but they're just not super clean. So it cleans up your code um, and tells you where the changes are to make your code more consistent with the consensus of what good code looks like. Again, not something I'm going to be forcing upon you in this class, but just know for future reference, when you're writing a bunch of code and collaborating with people, that's a thing that you can reference. Because otherwise, like, what is it? What, if you don't use that, what does it leave you? A bunch of fights bickering over like what the right way to do it is, and like you can just reference a standard. That's easy. Okay, so we're gonna take a break because it's time for break, and uh, we're gonna come back at eight fifty. So then we'll come back and do an exercise. Okay, well, it's break time, and then I'm gonna be answering questions offline. Come back at eight fifty.
All right, so I think everybody's back. So now we're going to form partnerships with someone you have not been in a partnership with before. Again, 
I know it's like crazy, right? <laughs> so it, this whole semester is gonna be this again. Find a partner you have not been a partner with before. <laughs> yeah, and and also you'll have to move physically closer to them. <laughs> and and you'll want to clear out some space. So like if you have a computer in front of you, you'll want to get rid of that computer. It's just not going to be useful. You'll need lots of physical space on the desk in front of you. Because I have things in my hands. There is an odd number of people. Given you. <laughs> no, I ended up with three. So there's going to be a group of three, I think, right? It's be a group. Okay. So what's going on? So at the beginning of class, we 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 talked. We mentioned the fact that there are special words that you are going to need to memorize. That's just like your life. And so this is a game, and the game is you have a set of words and you have a set of definitions. And so the hack of things that I gave you is composed of two, uh, two sets, right? The, the words and the definitions. And so your game with your partner will be to match those up. So there's 26 term and definition pairs. So at the end of this exercise, you should have 26 pairs. When you give those back to me, they're not going to be given in the same arrangement. So you're going to give me back to them as a set of ordered pairs. So the, Sort of unordered pairs. So I want you to pair up all the terms and definitions, and then at the end of the exercise, you'll give me back a stack of 52 pieces of paper with paired. Right. So right now they're not paired; they're two separate sets. I will need all five binder clips back with the exercise, right? Because those are I'm not a teacher of salary, right? Like I need these binder clips. But <laughs> so give me back the five binder clips and all the pairs of the pieces of paper, terms and definitions. Go. Oh, by the way, I haven't defined any of these for you, so. <laughs> yeah, so you're going to actually have to use your process of deduction and asking the instructor. Right? And so this is the exercise.
So like that reinforces the ordering of this class. Yeah. <laughs> it's intuitive. All right. All right. So you should be finishing up. If you have not finished up and you need help, there are people who are idle and they have finished, so you can get the help. If you have finished, take all of your pairs, stack them up, and give me back the pairs in binder clips. Right. It'll be deployed at the student's next month. So. However you want to get those five binary clips, I don't care. But I need the binary clips and all the pairs. That is it. Yes. So everything is being carried. My curiosity is like when I tell you to all find new partners you haven't worked with before, and, and everyone should complain at the same time. I don't have anyone I haven't worked with, and I'll be like, <laughs> when that will occur, I do not know. I guess I'll do like, uh, 22, 21 interactions. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. 
Thank you. Good deal. Everybody, so, uh, everybody done? All right. So now, just a quick verbal feedback. Like, what were your thoughts on that exercise? Waste of time? Like, you know, best exercise ever? Like, great course? Like, what what is the feedback on that exercise? Quickly. All right. What do you think? The results were built through consensus. So, <laughs> so the I will be uh, providing basically these are like flashcards, right? You can think of it as flashcards. Those that will be provided to you um, in Blackboard as a Word document, and so the Word document has all the actual pairs as like a table, right? And so all I did was print that Word document and then like snip it all up, and so you'll have access to the actual official Ben Payne answers. Because I made those all up. So, <laughs> uh, but any other questions or comments on that? Like, I value your feedback. Yeah. The what? Absolutely. Right. So, it's, so, like, the fun thing that I don't know if everybody observed here, but like, almost every team has a different methodology through which they attack the same problem. This was a super simple problem, right? Like, pair pieces of paper. But every single pair of you. Had a different strategy, right? Some were, you know, like a 50-50 a balance. Some were in the, like the 20-80 balance, right? And then like there were strategies of like how do you lay out the paper, right? So all these like trivial negotiations, right? But, like you're interacting with people to figure out how to do that. Thanks. So yes, that was absolutely part of the exercise. In the end, like towards the end of this class, you'll all know each other a little better. That is one of the outcomes. So in the end, I'll be advertising that you should all keep in contact as a social network because you're all moving together through this curriculum. And after you leave here around the same time, you'll be able to reference each other as a great social network, right? And so like, yes, I'm intentionally building y'all as a group. Yeah, so <laughs> there will be more pair activities for the rest of the semester. OK. I think I'm going to probably. Well, I guess we'll we'll do a really quick vote. Um, so, in black, this is where now you'll be in Blackboard and you'll want to vote. Um, so, question is: Given this list with these strings, what would that command return? And we'll vote on that. So, I'm going to set up a vote quickly in Blackboard. Uh, no, 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 no. And we'll create a. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, good cool. I think. All right. So the the choices that I'm going to give you are either a three or a four. And to make that super simple, I'll just give you four choice vote. All right, and then we're going to go back to here. So this is the list, and the question is, what does that command return from the the value there? All right. Take a moment to vote in Blackboard. I'm going to. Just skim back over here and see what the answers are, according to y'all. All right, so almost everyone is going with four, with a few votes for three. So let's see what we've got here. I'm going to say that there are, you can count the elements, right? There's one element, two elements, two elements, four elements. So the return here is going to be a four. All right, so now we move on to something slightly more confusing. So we have a question. Given the same list that I just gave you, what does uh, my list one return? And this I'm going to do a little bit of whiteboarding for you. All right, I'm going to stop this. I'm going to create a new timer, a new uh, poll. I'm going to give two choices. I can't put it there. So, sorry. Let's wipe it up. Go to poll. Stop that. Oh, I killed the poll. There we go. Two choices. And so the two choices. So let's go back here. So my list one. And then I'm going to give you uh, one is equal to A and two. So if you think that my list one to return A, then you're going to vote for 1. And 
if you think that my list one will return B, then you're going to vote for two. Questions on that? So it's a little, it's a little wanky because uh, Blackboard's polling is a little out of chinks, but so two is what everybody voted on. So let's see what that works out to. Right. So the in the trick there is just reinforcing the point that the indexing is from zero. So the first element or the first element is A, but the element accessed by one is B. So thank you. Makes me feel better. Right. This is a this class is to make me feel better. So thank you for helping with that. All right. So what have we covered? So in lecture one, uh, we talked about CSV JSON XML. And we demonstrated in this class so far the use of the Python REPL. And then we've covered some things like lists and dictionaries. So that's good stuff. And a little pro tip, if you're wondering what is in the current working environment, as far as memory, you can use the Dirk command. All right. Questions? I don't think so. We're going to move on. Yeah. OK. So let's see. So now we're going to move into the Jupyter section. Jupyter is that web interface I've been advertising to and talking about um, and using a little bit. And we're going to be, in this class, focused on really small scale data, right? Like a gigabyte or less, obviously, and uh, really simple computations. But that's not to say that's only what it's used for. It's used by really big companies for really complicated problems. And that's um, an interesting sort of like indicator that you can scale up the complexity and the data that you're operating with in Jupyter. That's good. All right. So there are some problems with Jupyter, um, and there are some good talks on what those problems are. Primarily, the issue is cell execution order, which you'll probably run into, which is why in my homework assignments, I say that in, when I grade your homework, the cells have to execute top to bottom in order. And so that's sort of like, well, of course they don't operate in order, right? But the problem is you can execute the first cell and the second cell and the third cell and then go back to the first cell and execute that. And like, you can get this out of order execution of cells, which in some sense is handy, but reproducing that is hard. And so I, as a requirement, I will only judge your homework based on that order of execution. Okay. All right, and then to add in to this layer of complexity, right, we have your computer. It's running either Anaconda or Anaconda or Docker. And then we have Jupyter hosting a Python environment. And in, in that, we're going to use Pandas. So this huge stack of software to do you know, the thing that you actually care about. So that's a little complicated. So I've talked to a few of you in, offline, but the idea of Pandas is that it has some useful data structures for most of what we do in, in data science. Because if you remember, the most popular table, the most popular tool in data science, I'll claim, is Excel. Excel is primarily focused on tables of data, right? Rows and columns. And so, not surprisingly, I'm using Pandas because Pandas is a module for Python which handles tables of data. And so, there's lots of sort of nuances and like tricks of why Pandas is more powerful than Excel, in my opinion. Uh, it's easier to use. Um, sometimes, but uh, so basically, we're going to be using pandas, and there's that'll be like all of class. All right, so now I'm going to give you a quick demo because we have a few minutes left here, and let's look at this, this web page. All right, all right, anybody here in like hardcore bowling, like <laughs> scoring 250 or above? No, okay, so. Me neither. I'm not a bowler. Um, but I like data. And this happens to be a web page that I found that has data on it. Like almost all pages have data on them, but this one's cool. So OK. <laughs> Bowling is where you do that like thing where you roll the ball, right? <laughs> but it turns out that's not all it is. There are also um, conferences, right? And like championships and records and all this other great stuff. And so people get together to talk about bowling. <laughs> it's like crazy, right? But so there are conferences booked out through 2027, right? And so these, this is a random web page containing a list of like bowling conferences with the attendance by year and the location, right? This is just like, there's no point in me actually showing you the bowling data. The point is we want to do some analysis of some random data, and this happened to be a choice we made. All right, so everybody here is getting the gist, right? We have years on the left side, and we have 
cities, and then we have how many people attended the conference in the city. And so, obviously, the conferences that haven't been heard yet, those don't have any attendance. And so, um, for my purposes, because I'm a crazy wild guy, I want to see what this graph looks like. Right? There's a visualization of this data that would be very sort of like cool to look at. And the question is. Right. Back in 2018, there were 7,500 people who visited Syracuse, New York, to talk about a bowling conference. Back in the day, let's go down to the bottom here. In Chicago, in 1901, there were 41 people. So you can sort of think like there was a growth, right, of attendance. So the question is, what does that growth look like? Okay, and so obviously you could do this in Excel to graph this thing. I'm going to use pandas because that's what I do. All right. All right, so I'm coming back into uh, Jupyter, and I happen to have written a notebook that does what I'm describing. All right, so what this, this is going to be like a recurring theme. I wrote a notebook. I'm going to walk you through the commands that I use, and I'm going to share these notebooks with you after uh, class through Blackboard. And so you'll have access to all this on your own. Uh, this is just me walking through the logic that I use to do the thing that I just described to you I want to do. I want to visualize this data. And it sounds relatively straightforward, right? Like, we have three columns data. We just want to plot that third column versus the time. How hard could that be? <laughs> All right, this is a leading question. It's hard. All right. So first step I take is I import this library called Pandas. That I've already advertised to you. And then um, I'm stealing data from this website. So I'm just going to like have it in the CSV. So this is like a, a step that I took. This sort of all I did, right? This is sort of like what you were doing with uh, your text editor, but I, I took I took all this data, copied it, let's scroll up, and I just copied it into a CSV file. So that's all I did. All right, and I'm going to use pandas to take the contents of that file, read that CSV, and load it into a variable called dframe. So this data frame is the name I'll call it. I'm going to look at the contents of that. And the contents are sort of what you'd expect. Right at the top of that file contains the following information. I've got the row index. So this is row 0 through 4. And the columns, oh, wait a minute. That's not quite wanted. I wanted to have the, the years and the city and the count, oh, but I didn't do that. <laughs> yes, John. Does the dot and I follow Yes. So, so uh, by default, I think it shows the top five columns. So you can you can rerun this to say like add ten, and then it will show you the top ten columns. So there's a yeah. So exactly. So what about the headers? Great question. So what happened was pandas assumed that the top line of a CSV contains the headers, right? Which is what happened here is it assigned the top row of the CSV. As the header. All right. So, what do we do? Well, we can have this uh, keyword in here called header when we load the CSV and we tell pandas explicitly there is no header. So, so that's like this is the the struggle of programming is like you do a thing that you expect to work, it doesn't work, then you have to do something different. All right. So, that's going to be like your life for the rest of the semester. <laughs> so. I now have a different command where I read that same CSV. I tell pandas not to look for a header, and then I load it in the dframe and I look at that. And it's it's more what I want, right? So it's not assuming the top column is there as a header. So it sort of looks like what we want, but you'll notice sort of like like foreshadowing. I didn't actually want two columns in that last one. But anyways, let's just verify what's going on in that CSV. I'm not using this. Magic, which I'll talk about later. I'm looking at the CSV content. I realize what's going on, right? That third column had a comma in it without the quotes, which is what we're talking about with CSVs. And so now it's assuming that this is like column one, two, three, four, five, and it's just like, uh, I don't know what's going on. Right? It doesn't recognize the fact that those are the population in thousands. All right, so what are we going to do? <laughs> one thing that I'm not going to do is I'm going to not 
go into that CSV and manually add all the quotes to make it safe. I, that's like, it's not a, not a thing that scales well when I have thousands of rows. So manually fixing the file is something I will almost never advocate in this class. The other thing I'm going to do just to like make my description of this process slightly easier is I'm going to throw in what the actual column headers as I understand them are. So I'm going to force the name of the columns to be the following. So that'll just make me talking to you a little bit easier. Like let's, let's formalize what it is that we're talking about. So really what's going on is in this, in this column of count one, I have the thousands place. In that other column, I have the hundreds place. There's other ways to throw in the column headers, but for time's sake, we'll skip on past that. All right, so if you remember, back in that bowling website, way down at the bottom, there weren't thousands of attendees. And so you have like 41 people, 61 people, 78 people. So what happens there? So again, I'm going to use the, the tail command, which shows us the bottom of that data set. And it is assuming that this was 41 in this column because there was no comma for the other place, right? And so that's really going to throw us off and just make a bad day because what happens is it didn't see uh, a, what is that, a one, two, three, four, fifth column. And so it's just going to throw in not a number. It's like a pandas way of handling the fact that there's some missing data. So now you recognize that we have a real hard problem, which is some of the columns have a thousands place and a hundreds, and others have just like the hundreds place but in the wrong column. Make sense? It has to be shifted off by one. All right, so <coughs> really what we want to do is we want to take the column that has the thousandth place, multiply that by a thousand, and then add in the hundredth column, right? So that's, we're going to join those two columns. And this is just demonstrating proof of concept that I can do that. I'm accessing the count one column, multiply by a thousand, and then when I add those two together, I get the thing that I actually intended. Right, so that first value of 7566, that should match up on my website. And then 2018. Yeah, so that was that value, but now in pandas. All right, so, so far so good. But you'll remember down at the bottom, oh shoot, right? That, that fifth column had nans in it. So when I add a nan and a number, it says not a number. So that, that, that algorithm isn't going to quite work out. All right, so now we have to do some real magic, right? The real magic is figuring out what happens, and we're going to have two different cases. One case is where the fourth column has a number and the fifth column has a number, and add those to an appropriate manner, which is this thing. Or we want to return just the value in the fourth column when the fifth column contains a man. So that's my function, right? There's a, there's a conditional if-else statement, and if that fifth column is a, net, add a number, and we're just going to return the value in the fourth column. And if it's uh, if there is if there are two values, add them appropriately. So this is a quick demo of where to use a function. And I'm going to apply that function to uh, all of I'm going to apply this function to this data frame for every row. I'm going to cycle through all the rows. And the output from that function will be stored in a new column called total. All right, so we do that, get back down to uh, a data frame, and we'll just take a look at the top of it. And it says we have the year, the city, the state, and the count, and the count, and then the thing we care about. So, so far, in that first case where we have two columns of, vari of values, this is the set of values that I care about. So, so far, I'm good. The other condition. At the bottom of the chart, where there was no fifth column, we applied that same function, and we got back to the thing we care about. So we're good. <laughs> this was complicated, right? I mean, like, this is a lot of work to just do a simple plot. What was that? Uh, I don't think you have to do that, no. It recognizes other objects. so. So this is my whole data frame, blah, 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 blah. All right, so now I'm going to use uh, a command in pandas that references a library called matplotlib, and I can plot this data, right? 
So I happen to have one access with it, uh, with probably the conference attendees. And then down here, like I have some charts, but it's like uh, not quite what I expected in the sense that the, the year, right, is missing labels. And it's like, well, what happened there? And so there's a little clue here. There's a clue that this thing here is missing. And oh, sorry, your name, thank you. Alex, uh, Alex pointed out that the variables were not stored as numbers. And so the year here is encountering some issues. Like that's the fact that it's like backwards and missing values, it didn't throw an error, but it's not quite what we expected. So this is where you as a human data scientist come in and say, huh, there's more work to be done, even though there are no errors. <laughs> All right. All right. So what's going on? Well, we'll look at our data frame. We look through it. It's like, I see these are all numbers, but what's going on, right? And so one of the things that Pandas does for you is like, um, it'll show you, if you ask for it, show me the whole data frame, and your data frame has like thousands of rows, it doesn't actually show you the whole data frame. It adds in these little ellipses here. They're like, we're hiding some content. And it has that our error is in this hidden set of fields. Like annoying. All right. So back to that comment about data types. If we look at the type of each of the columns, we can see that uh, we have quotes here. So that looks good. All right. So these count values are quotes, but the year is an object. And that's a tip off that it didn't quite get the right value. So let's see what happens when we say force that year column to be all numbers. And what we get is an error. And the error tells us exactly what the problem is. Right? You can see here, unable to parse the string 1943 to 45. You're like, what the hell? Like, all right, so let's look back at our data. All right, so scrolling, so 2018, everything looks good. We've got a city, we've got a state, and we've got a count, right, even though it's got a print, uh, comma in it. Let's scroll down to that problematic year. Mm -hmm. Look at that. All right, so what happened here? <laughs> yes, the, the, you know, the audible sort of like, God damn it. Like, like this is the correct response, right? So, so what happened? Someone typed manually this list onto a web page, and because they're human, they didn't adhere to a consistent convention for how to represent this data. <laughs> and so this is the problem, right? Like, you will have what you think is a reasonable set of data, except you have unreasonable people producing it. That's the, the real root cause, right? All right, so just I think for grins, eventually I went back into another data frame and I probably fixed this. But I think I'm gonna skip past it. Yeah. Anyways, maybe let's try running to see if it works. <coughs> I'm a little short on time, so I'm gonna probably just leave these up uh, in notebook. Yeah, okay. So here I fixed, so in this notebook, which I'll share with you, um, I did fix the problem, so, and used a slightly different approach, which you can look through back. Um, but the, the point here is that uh, it is possible to fix the data, and you get sort of a plot that's more reasonable, right? So you've got year on this axis, growth sort of like makes sense, and you've got a, um, all the data points there, so it, it makes more sense. So. It is possible to solve this problem, but in the interest of time, we're going to move on. Right. Questions before? I haven't completed this, but questions on what we have covered so far. The anger at, right at the individual humans who produce this data? Yeah. Okay. All right. Mm. All right, so there's some best practices, and we're going to be doing visualization basically in every single class. This is like, this will be very hard to internalize for you, but I'm going to start you here so that you, I can point you back to, well, you should stick to that principle, right? This is like a, a well-founded guiding principle of like, what is a good visualization? So I showed you something that I thought made sense for the data, but it's totally subjective, right? I made a decision that a scatter plot 
with the right size dots, color blue, with these access labels, is the best way to tell a story. That is a set of decisions that I made based primarily on my experience. But if you don't have experience, you can fall back to a principle. And this is a way of sort of capturing what is it that I should be aiming for? Because do I want a bar chart? Do I want a scatter plot? Do I want a histogram? Like all kinds of questions, right? All right. So if you're not a huge visualization person, hopefully in this class I can get you to have a little bit of exposure. There's great resources because this is a really common problem, not just in data science, but like everyone who works with data has to eventually visualize it usually. All right. So yeah, I'll just open this up because it's a pretty uh, beautiful thing to look at in my opinion. <laughs> All right, so if you've only seen like bar charts and scatter plots, this hopefully is intended to open your eyes to what could be, right? <laughs> Which can be kind of intimidating, but there's a huge number of charts to choose from. Which is awesome, right? Like, I didn't even know that some of these existed. So like the fact that they've all been cataloged for me, super useful. Right, and you can click on into any one of these, like candlestick chart. I actually have used that, but let's see what it looks like. So it talks about, here's a quick example, some description, right? all the words, like, like all of these things. Like People literally spend their life like, getting a PhD on visualization. Like That's a whole field. So if you're like, I don't understand this. Well, it's because you haven't spent a year studying it yet. But um, there are web stores, there are websites that can help you guide through that. All right, so the, 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 the really helpful chart here um, is intended to guide you through the process of when to choose which chart for what purpose. Right? And so you, you'll be able to like, look back on these through the slides, but the point is someone has spent the effort to come up with sort of like a decision tree to figure out when should I use uh, a pie chart versus like a, a surface chart. Like there's tons of different choices. and so. It can be, again, intimidating because you have this whole catalog of things to choose from. But there is sort of a reasonable way of going about figuring out when to use what. Okay. All right. And then uh, I think my last point in visualization here is that it's a dead field. Right. Don't worry about it. Oh, wait. I, I, I lied. I'm bad. So it's actually like totally blowing up, right? Because like there are new problems. And the new problems are. Right, large scale data visualization. Right, if, if you only have a few things to plot, it's not that many choices of what to do. Right, but when you literally have billions of data points, visualizing that is hard. Right, at scale, making this really pretty chart is something we just historically could not have done a few years ago. It would have taken a huge amount of effort potentially, but like this is not something that anyone can do. That's that's really cool. There's a lot of like tricks about how they got this to like, look so beautiful, but it's a really nice thing to look at, um, hard to understand. So you can actually zoom in here and like look at any one of these points and really find out like, the city scale, and it's really nice to look at. All right. And then like the other thing that was like, mind-boggling that I will not have time to cover in this class is like, there's a grammar of graphics. And so if you think about it, like there are rules to language about how we construct sentences, and there's flexibility within those rules. And there's the same thing being developed actively for graphics. So that's that's a very really powerful thing because like rather than saying like lay down this axis and lay down this other axis and lay down this point, you can just like describe your computer what it is you want to the outcome to be, and then like it figures out what to do. It's like a totally different paradigm of solving the visualization problem. Okay. So in this class, I'm not doing the huge visualizations or the grammar of graphics. I'm just going to talk about very very low level visualization tools. Two of them specifically MATLAB, Matplotlib, so and, and Seaborn. So those are the our primary visualization tools. I'm not going to constrain you to those in this class, but that's what I'll be I'll be demonstrating and using. Okay. Yes. I think I'm going to skip through this a little bit because we're out of time. But so basically there's uh, CSVs aren't as simple as you think because people use them or abuse them. And so there's lots of ways to go wrong with a CSV, and as a data scientist, you will encounter all of them. And the consequence for you is that you'll have to handle that data, even though it's malformed, basically, right? Like a person who didn't know what a CSV was produced one, now it's your job to, to do a data analysis against those bad CSVs. So that's just like 
com coming up this semester. All right. So even though all of this is very painful, there are people who make money just talking about it, <laughs> like me. <laughs> no. All right. So, but no, you, you can actually go on the internet, and there's tons of blogs talking about like how they stepped through this crazy problem, and those are pretty useful to read sometimes. Like, like hopefully they can meet you at your level of where you're at, but. They'll talk through like I gave it. I had this dirty data set. There's a thing I wanted to do, and so I had to clean this data up to get it into a state to be useful. That's like a whole logging industry. But uh, all right, the data is dirty. Yeah. Oh, this is just a pet peeve that I'll just visit here for a moment. All right. So you thought that the data that we looked at was was bad, right? And let's look at some real data. Mm, Official scoring records, probably. All right. So what we started with, um, this is even one that's good. Yeah, so so what we started with was basically something that I could quickly convert into a CSV. It wasn't that bad, right? Like we had to do some 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 data munging to it. But more often, you'll see things like this, where it's just like a PDF, right, which is horrendous to parse. And then you have to extract the data from the PDF. But the data in the PDF doesn't look anything like a CSV. Right? It's got all this, like, Titles and like headers, things that make it beautiful to read for humans, but hard to parse for machines. And so, a lot of your skill set will be developed forcing things that were never meant for a computer into a data processing architecture that you can then manipulate. So a lot of this class will be spent on that that part of how do I get the data out of something that doesn't and isn't intended for analysis into something that can be analyzed. Mm. Yeah, okay, skip over that and this and this and that. Well, this is a thing that you should read, but I'm going to get you hopefully out of class reasonably on time, have it a little over. Yeah, okay, homework. So this is a, I can pull it up. All right, so this is uh, an assignment for you to do over the course of the next week. It's basically just watch a YouTube video. Not that hard, right, but that's not the homework. All right, so the actual homework is threefold. One is to, uh, let's see. yeah, so just count the number of characters in a string. And then the next one is to take a list and to shift its elements. We'll talk about that for a second. And the third one is to download a CSV and load it in Jupyter. So those aren't intended to like stump you. They're meant to sort of flex your, your starting uh, with, with Python. All right. So I'm going to talk about these two in a little bit more depth. And for all three of them, uh, you'll see there's a consistency here. I want the Python notebook. You have to actually upload a Python notebook containing your solution. Then next week, there's going to be a code review. So, uh, did I not? Then, there we go. What was that side by side? Yeah. So if those aren't sufficient for you, there's tons of other work, but I won't do that. All right, so now we're going to do, in our remaining last few minutes, a little exercise where I give you the assignment, and you're going to design a solution on paper. All right, you're actually going to do this with your wrist. No, you're going to keep it. All of this is what you'll keep. I just want the notebook that comes out of this. So, so this is going to be like step one, part one of two, for this assignment. And then you're going to actually design uh, a solution by answering these steps. So this is like the design methodology, right? So first you say, what am I starting with, and what, what do I want? Those are the first two steps. You define your endpoints. Once you've defined your endpoints, then you can say, what are the steps that will get me from where I start to where I end? And then what are the dependencies that I need to solve for those steps? Right, and how do I start implementing those? And then once you've designed your solution, then you go to your computer and you type things in. All right, so while you're writing this down, I want to shout out, like, what's a good starting point? Okay. Yeah. So that's, you're creating a function? Okay. What would be the argument? Do you have an argument, or what do you do with the argument? Uh, 
Jadi tempat yang So that's uh, so you are assuming what are you assuming? So that is a function that you can call against the string. Yeah. Yes. So that's not all we need. So, and where would that go? So what Dan was mentioning, where would that go? Yeah. Sorry? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so you, well, you want to return it. Yeah. Okay. So this, this is sort of like the conversation that I want you to be having in your head of like, what am I starting with and what do I want to do? And, right. So well, <laughs> this will be a recurring pattern. But um, so then once you've written down what you're starting with, like I, I don't see very many people writing. I'm not sure if they're bored or. Just <laughs> So the next step is to write down the steps you would need to take. And so again, <laughs> I strongly advocate writing down on paper your design. The problem that I've seen historically is people say, I don't need paper. I'm just going to turn in a notebook. So I'll just start in a notebook. And the problem that I encounter with that situation is they start typing, they run an error, they debug it, and they're just like, even know what I'm doing anymore. Like they get lost in the decoding and the, and actually the troubleshooting, and they get lost about what it is that they were actually trying to do. Oh. So, so someone could come along and pass an integer, and you'd be like, oh, I didn't expect that. Right. Right. So that's yeah. why we that's the thing that's worried about. If you're just being started with Python, do not worry about error checking. But what Alex is describing is when someone passes you an argument that you didn't expect, what do you do with that? OK, so I think, yeah, so same, same idea, right? And I'm holding you past class. But basically, what I'm advocating here is um, take the assignment that I, was, that I gave you in this in Blackboard. And it's basically saying, like, here's a list, I want to do this. Right? So the question is, like, what did we start with? What do we want to end with? What are the steps we need to take to do that thing? And <laughs> these will be complicated. Like, I, I, if this takes you more than three hours, like, I won't be surprising. But what I don't want you to do is take a continuous three hours. You should say, struggle with this, half an hour, ask for help, right? Talk to me, look this up. Like, you should struggle, but not for, like, 24 hours in a row, right? It should be, like, Struggle, ask a question, I'll provide you some response. Right? Like that's how that iterative process works. So do not sit there and be like, you know, this assignment is due on Tuesday. I have to spend all of Tuesday doing it. Like that's probably not going to work for you. Great. Okay, I think I'll let you go because it's fast class. But yeah, if you want to stay, feel free to stay. Yeah, and there are some slides in here that will be helpful for the homework, so you want to check back on those yeah, stream manipulations. Okay.